My very great pleasure to introduce our guest this afternoon, Kenny Taylor, who's a kind of, I think of a, a renaissance man of the natural world. Um, Kenny, I first met, I guess, through his work in Northwoods magazine, where he published poetry, but also wrote the most beautiful essay about the Dun about his, his journey up the Dunbeek River. And he subsequently took over editorship of that wonderful magazine, which of course we're quite close to here on the programme. Um, Kenny is also an ecologist, a kind of nature activist. He writes essays. He's been widely published in magazines such as BBC Wildlife Magazine, the National Geographic, and a range of other publications. He's also a photographer and a musician. Um, and he's here today to talk about his role both as editor of North Woods, but also as a writer with interests, as I say, deeply embedded in the natural world. Kenny, welcome. And we're going to organise the afternoon like this. Eddie, uh, Kenny has some pieces that he's going to read from us, from essays that he's written. We're going to have discussion. We're going to have question and answer, as always. It's going to be a very informal event. If at any time, before the official question and answer, you want to intervene or you have any questions, please feel free to do so. But for now, let us welcome Ken Taylor to Dundee. So, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation to, to come here. I go back a long way, actually, to with to I was just thinking last night as I was walking around that I'm old enough to have seen David Bowie playing in the Carriage Hall, which not very many people can say, actually. He hardly played in Scotland at all. So I'm forever associating this part of um, Scotland with a kind of creativity, if you like. So, you know, thankfully. And just, I wouldn't go on about David Bowie at great length, but I have to tell you that it was in a phase where he was athletic enough. It was the main stage on the Caird Hall at that time, and the old speakers, that technology. The speakers were piled up on either side of the stage to the extent that the top speaker nearly reached to the first gallery. And at one stage, he leapt up on the different speaker stacks and shook hands with people in the first circle and then went back down again. So anyway, that's part of the way that I've got to D in my mental map. I spent a long time in St Andrews, I was just discussing with Chris there, uh, who we heard at one of the earlier sessions about that. And one of the things I can read is really based on time spent on the other of May. But I don't know if you want me to say about how do you want to play it, Kirsty? Yeah. Whether you want me to say something about Northwards now? Or, no, or, let's start with a little bit okay. and then we'll discuss your writing life and we'll get on to your editorial work later. Okay, so this is something which is it's in the current edition of uh, New Writing Scotland and it's based on something that happened a long time ago when I was actually a warden of the Isle of May National Nature Reserve, or what was to become the Isle of May Natural uh, National Nature Reserve. One of the things that I'm interested in as a writer is reflecting the natural world, if it makes sense, not as a, quote, nature writer, which in fact, actually, that's a term that I don't like very much, um, but as a writer who draws on nature as part of what I do. I think... Um, for example, and I'm not making personal comparisons here, but just you know, to give the, the kind of symbolism of it, um, you know, okay, Van Gogh is known for sunflowers, but you don't call him a flower painter, for example. And that's my problem with the term nature writing. I think at worst it can lead you, it can lead certain writers down a path that's a little bit too primrosy. Um, so what I'm interested in is, is writing in itself. And because my own experience is drawn largely from uh, being out and about in, in nature, as well as other things, then that's how I draw on it. But I hope, as you'll see from this piece, that my take on things isn't always um, a comfortable one in terms of how we relate to nature. So this piece is drawn from that time. 
and it's part essay, I guess, but um, part just creative non-fiction or not creative. So we'll just fire away with it. And if, if this gets too boring, you know, I can give a go at my way or something like that. I've seen it earlier with Chris, you know, if, if things are, it's not, you know, it's been very civilised in here, but it's very noisy. Those can have a rent while I'm going to go. Um, so anyway, this is called Sea Life. Um, so I'm going to read the first part of it. And then stop. Um, this piece is called Cull, and I'll do part of it and stop. Sometimes there was an instant of silence before the sky exploded with noise. That's how it could seem, at least when you approached the edge of the colony. Turn the corner, stop, and there they were, momentarily unaware. Gulls, thousands of them, stippling the island's turf and rocks with the whiteness of their bodies and the grey and the charcoal of their wings. Sea foam and storm full of clouds caught in those colours, almost monochrome but with undertones of other tones. Plus two, the yellow of each eye and needle of sun, bright, fierce, and more than a little threatening. Then one, two, a hundred notice and react by screaming alarm as they take flight. Some others stand their ground, stiffening wings and necks and shouting defiance from the tops of boulders. I see them silhouetted, the slimness of beaks and legs, the sleekness of each body revealed against sunshine and the sea beyond, where the surface shimmers like fish scales. Silver, gold, black, grey, and white noise, the din of gull calls. This is our place. This is our place. And so it had been for centuries, millennia maybe, until then. Herring gulls, those were the main gulls on the island at that time, plus some pockets of blackbacks, both great and lesser. Kittywakes with nestfuls of gentle-looking chicks thrown the cliffs. They were the roamers of the waves and deeps, able to range the North Sea over. The inland isle was the domain of other, larger gulls. They could fly out far from land too, but their usual gliding ground was much closer inshore. Named for the fish that once shoaled by the billion around Scottish coasts, herring gulls had been linked to people for generations here, back at least to the time when the island got its name. Moka Oya, Moai, May, the shift from Norse Gull Island to the main of recent centuries is like an exercise for jaws and lips. It speaks volumes across the times when gulls thrived and what people threw away. When the fishing was from small wooden boats, they'd have followed, even who knows, near a Stone Age canoe, watching as lines were hauled, quick to grab anything from overboard. Fish heads, glistening guts, small fry, starfish, raw material for the gulls of Fife, fit to recycle into wing feathers and sinews and keep the spark in those eyes alight. They'd have followed the brown-sailed trawlers too, the old broad beam twins and the black hulled zulus, and the steam drifters with their smoking funnels and even bigger catches. Still, the rain of debris would come from deck to sea, the unwanted fish of no commercial value, and the innards to nourish, nourish the scavengers, gulls most of all. And when the herring shoals slumped and the big fishing faded, there were still some insured boats for them to follow back to the harbours of the East Meek. Once creels had been hauled for lobsters, velvet crabs, and prawns. But by now, it wasn't so much the fishing that sustained the gulls as the main. It was rubbish. Great, stinking, bulldozer shunted mounds of it. Landfill sites near the coastal towns, where the detritus of urban life was dumped and shoveled and shaped and earthed over, those were the takeaways of choice for the gulls. Some nests carried signs of the shore based dining. Bread wrappers, packaging for bacon and fast food meals, plastic toys from cereal packets, and the evidence of visits to raw sewage outfalls was there too, and the condoms and tampons coughed up among the sea pinks and the green stems of the island turf. The transformation of rubbish to gold flesh was an appealing one, I reckon, even if it sometimes recalled from the, recoiled from the din, from the attack dives of angry parent gulls as I neared the nest or the hot bladder of shit over hair and clothes. But there was a problem, said the power that now sought to shape the island's wilds and manage them according to their plans, their targets and policy statements. Too many gulls, that was the issue. Boosted by the landfills, the sewers and some bycatch, 
the population had boomed. The island was becoming a gold slum, some said, with the plants suffering and other birds kept away. There was no sign of it stopping, so something would have to be done. There were census figures to show the trend, signs to underpin the action, and it wasn't as if the big gulls were particularly appealing to many people in any case. Kitty wakes with their fluffy chicks and limpid eyes might have been different, but these other gulls, the gimlet-eyed, raucous dummy pickers, had to be reined in. She says less, would scarcely be noticed after all. So the plans were made. A call would be carried out by a team of conservation workers from the mainland, assisted by island-based staff. I was that staff, and if I was to keep my summer job, I had to comply with the campaign to help with its execution. They arrived early one morning at a jetty, a small group of anorak-clad naturalists ready to do business among the gulls. Tactics were simple, to place small squares of bread beside each nest. Bread was to be smeared in margarine. Margarine would be laced with poison. On returning to its nest, a gull would see the food, swallow it, and then slowly fall asleep, eventually dying of hypothermia. A return from the coal team to the same part of the colony a day or so later could take out its mate. Plastic gloves were to be worn at all times and the corpses would be collected after a few hours. Any questions? I wanted to ask why to speak up for the gulls to say no, but I stayed silent. Laying the bait was straightforward at first. Just locate a nest, the gulls always took flight in close approach, and place the ground beside it, perhaps a hand span from a cup of woven grasses where a clutch of speckled all of brown eggs was nestled. Not many eggs had hatched yet, but where they had, it didn't take long for things to turn ugly. The woman in the party was the first to find a brood. The gull chicks beside her were covered in pale down, dappled with darker spots. This will be useful, she said, raising the thick stick she'd been carrying to fend off low-flying parents. She brought it down with a thud on the first chick's head, then the next, then the next, then she moved on to another nest. Less work for future years, she said. I felt paralysed by what I'd just seen. Gosh. Okay. Thank you so much, Kenny. Now, we, we're, as I said, we're going to begin uh, with a discussion of Kenny's work as a writer. And I'm, I asked him to read from that section first by way of an introduction, and it's a gorgeous, um, a gorgeous reflection of what you said about how you resist this moniker nature writer, because what you're doing is something very, very different, as this piece shows. I want to talk about a couple of things, Kenny. First of all, Okay, we've got a very different kind of piece about nature shown in a very different sort of way. From the moment we arrive in that <coughs> rubbish infested mound of a place that is home to these wild creatures, we know we're in a different sort of landscape. As a writer, as a poet, and I will say essayist at the moment, but I take your point about the other kinds of writing, we'll talk about that later. Um, does your imagination begin with your journeys out into these places and your experiences in them, or does it begin with maybe something else you've read? Is it an idea that you might have been forming yourself as part of your own research, and then you find the representation of that in the so-called natural world? Tell us a bit about your writing process. Thanks. I think it includes several of these things, but um, at the heart of it, a lot of the writing that I do, the creative writing that I do, it kind of works in a similar way between poetry and the, the writing that I was reading from then, that there's just something that captures you as an image and an experience that won't let you go, so there's something that's niggling away, and with poetry it could be a phrase with, um, that comes into your head. Um, with this piece here, then I'm very clear, and I won't give the game away, that there was a particular image which we can come back to in the part of this that I haven't read yet, which um, is very much a strong visual image of uh, something that wouldn't let me go. And if you like, I was writing um, that piece in part around that, the starting point of that 
hospital image, but also specifically to address what I was beginning to realise. It was the whole experience was saying to me about something that I care very deeply about, um, which comes into quite a bit of my writing, including, uh, for example, in the past, the first cover feature of a match for BBC Wildlife ages ago, a long time ago, was about magpies. Um, and magpies are a species which in this country, not in quite a few other countries, some people who claim to be bird lovers love to hate. So they're an out group. They're basically classed as, you know, how dare they come in and batter that um, sparrow to death on the lawn. They're nasty birds. So therefore, um, you know, they're, they're so-called vermin, which is another term that I love, because yeah. I don't really understand what that is. So um, in terms of my writing, part of what motivates me is sometimes doing things either in news reporting or in creative writing that are exploring my uneasiness about our ability as a human species within our to, to create outgroups of other species and also our ability within our own species to create outgroups wherever we are. So I guess that's and that's not answering your question completely, but I just know that there are certain things, and it, and it applies to most of the creative things that I do, so it's the same with music, um, that in terms of putting a tune together, a piece together, there's sometimes just a combination of notes or chords which tickles you, yeah. and it won't let you go. And um, for myself, for things that aren't finished, there are some things that I can have half a minute of a, of a piece, musically, which continues to really refresh me, even if I haven't finished it, because I kind of know what the bigger, or at least I'm getting an inkling of what the bigger thing is from it. But I have to have that sense of, yeah, uh, something that both tickles me, but I don't know it at the same time. And it's, it's that sense of slightly pushing to the unknown, which I guess is, is where your subconscious is coming up. And it's maybe my subconscious tickling me and saying, hmm, okay, that, that kind of either feels good or feels uncomfortable, etc. And without that, then it's dead. The other thing I know with my own writing, I'm, I'm the type of writer that varies a lot from person to person. I have to hear what I'm writing is spoken. So everything that I do, uh, and that includes, strangely enough, news pieces. I'm mean, writing a news piece for BBC World Clubs this morning, for example, from across there. Um, if I'm not hearing it in my head as I'm writing it, I know it's not good writing in my sense, then my sense I have to kind of hear the words. Um, everyone's different, but yeah, I have to hear it. And maybe that's, I don't know, because I like music, maybe that's what's going on. That makes sense. That's wonderful. Thank you. And I also um, think that sense of um, a sound sense was very present in the piece you just read. Uh, now the landscape of that piece takes in the kinds of interests that you've just described. Your sense of yourself as a kind of ethical ecologist, someone, as I say, deeply embedded in that world of animal, flora and fauna, and with a regard for it, um, that you have certain principles that you want to be seeing exercised that play out in the writing. But there's also there a sense of the journalist, and the researcher. So we get all of that kind of in that landscape that you just have provided. And we have a sense of you, the writer, hovering at the background, and then you enter fully into the piece with that phrase that you just finished with. I felt paralyzed by what I've seen. The I, the first person, enters the text at this point, and there's a kind of turn and a shift. When you spoke about your sense of yourself as an essayist and a writer of non-fiction, can you perhaps just talk a wee bit about that use of the first person? Yeah, that, I mean, it's an intriguing one for me because uh, really the bulk of what I've published is um, non-fiction in what well, hopefully is creativity and everything they do, but it's, it's not creative non-fiction in the sense of of that piece, I'm, I'm very, very used to writing news and features where you're actually keeping 
very often you're keeping the eye out of it. Um, not all the time. Um, and for bigger features, you would very much be trying to be in there. Where um, I find the concept of essays, for example, in longer form, very interesting, is that I'm not even myself sure at the moment where the boundary between uh, some of the things that I do and essays lies, in that some creative non-fiction, I think, is very visual. Um, I think Philip Lopez has actually written something about that, trying to distinguish between certain types of long-form non-fiction that you maybe wouldn't class as essay and essay, where there, there's a strong visual sense that might also not include the eye so much. Um, and where I'm starting to explore now in my own writing is what happens when, when I bring the eye I and I, it sounds quite rust, but you know, <laughs> when I and I come into it more. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure I know how to answer that question properly, other than to say that that's a step on a kind of writing process that I feel that I'm on now, when I'm wanting to expand more into something that is personal. And yet the scientist in me loves a certain objectivity and detachment at the same time. So, I don't know, that may be a problem, actually, for the writing that I do. There is that tension between the need to express things at an emotional level, at a gut level, but also the need to feel that this is really accurate. And I loathe writing about anything that's got inaccuracies, and I loathe it even more if it's writing about nature that's got inaccuracies in it. It jars in the way of an inappropriate or more than an inappropriate apostrophe, but you know, it kind of gets me. So I would say I'm a, I'm a novice in the I state. A, no, a novice in first person. I think that's a wonderful moment to ask you to take out your wonderful essay from the moment that you left it and to bring us back to that first person. <laughs> so just reprise the first part of that sentence. I felt paralysed by what I'd just seen. A naturalist, a person I thought would have a passion for life in its mind-boggling array of forms, taking life away in such a casual fashion, seeming to relish the killing. She noticed that I was still standing in the same place, must have noticed my expression. It's for the good of the eye, don't you know? We need to control these dolls or the whole place will get overrun with them. Come on now, there are plenty more baits to lay. And I continued, plodding along with my bucket of deadly bread, following orders, watching more chicks have their skulls smashed in, noticing that the other killers didn't seem to mind either, noticing that they didn't use the word kill, preferring cull or control, wondering what the hell I was doing, why I could think of nothing to say, nothing that would stop this. A collection of corpses came later. The lighthouse keeper helped by bringing a tractor drawn a trailer into different parts of the central island track, where piles of bodies could be dumped for collection. Not every gull was dead when you found it. Some still had flickers of movement and wings and feet and made strange, drunken seeming efforts to escape. This lack of coordination, flailing of limbs, made the whole thing worse. The once sleek and self-confident possessors of the colony were now themselves possessed by a force which destroyed from within, stripping them of dignity as it drained away their life. A blow in the head could be a kindness in those circumstances. At least, that's what I told myself as I raised the piece of beech timber I was now using the club as a club, and let it fall on the heads of those who had not yet died. But occasionally I'd see another lighthouse keeper, apart from the main group of people, walking slowly through the colony. Raymond had a limp, the legacy of a motorbike crash in his teens, but known him over a handful of years. He'd a measured way with words. He'd think about things before giving an answer to a question of motives, or sometimes just raise one eyebrow to make a point, non-verbally but effectively. Now he was moving past dead gulls, as if looking for something. Eventually, he paused and picked up a body. It flapped feebly, but with a continuous beating of one wing. He tucked it beneath his arm and went on, moving behind a bluff of rock and out of view. Sometimes later, I'd see him again, body swaying from side to side with the roll of his walk, 
As he went through another part of the colony, searching, it was near sunset when I saw him at last that day, his lumpen shape and silhouette against the sea. They don't need to die if you can keep them warm, he told me days afterwards. Some do, but if you find a gull that hasn't quite fallen asleep, you can bring it round. It takes a few hours, but the cardboard box in the engine room seems to work for most of them. He'd saved a handful of herring gulls that way on that day when thousands had died, coaxing them to wakefulness and warmth. He brought them back a few at a time, snuggled them in boxes, then went out to look for more. He kept them until dark. Then he released them, lifting each to the air and let it ri- letting it rise from the island to catch the updrafts from the open sea. By early evening, mounds of corpses were ready for destruction. Doused in petrol, they were torched. Feathers are quick to vanish in flame. Meat and bone take longer. An oily smoke, sometimes pale, often dark, rose above the island. It was such a calm evening, I remember. The coastline was visible from Stonehaven to St Abbs. The sky clear of cloud, the water smooth. Only the faintest of breezes moved the air and the smoke eastward, from the mouth of the Firth to the wide, wide sea. I watched until night came, and the steam from the pyres blended with the dark. In the silence, the silence was unending. Just beautiful. Kill, cull, gull, the homophones themselves suggest your sense of poetry your sense of that kind of sound sense, along with a deeply ethically embedded caring about that which you're writing, about which you're writing. Can you talk a little about your understanding of where poetry, poetics, and the kind of, I don't know, politics of the environment, going back to your resistance to that phrase in nature writing, how these two, passions come together and meet on the page? Well, I think sometimes it can be really important. I mean, obviously for a proportion of things, what we need is information about what's going on. But that I think we've probably most of us already reached almost over capacity in terms of the amount of bad news there is about the state of the planet. You know, so um, it's important to know, but we're so pressed down with it that you 